Hi, Becca C. Smith here, and today we are talking about story openers. I am so excited for this collaboration that was put together by Robert Jones from Story Detective. I have put his link and everyone that's involved links below of their channel, so go check out their videos as well. I just love this idea of the community coming together and talking about topics like story openers, you know, like how do you start your story, Is how important is it, all these things, and to get everybody's different points of view is just A, really helpful and be just really exciting to see all these different processes by different authors. So thank you, Robert, for including me in this collab. Okay, story openers. How important are they? How much should you reveal? How much do you show? And how much of a hook do you need? These are the kind of questions that I usually sit down and try to figure out before I start a story. I mean, sometimes opening will just come. You'll just be sitting there and you suddenly know how to start your story. That's wonderful. But sometimes it's just helpful for me to ask these questions when I have an overall idea of the story I want to write, but I haven't really figured out where in the story I want to start it if that makes sense. Now, I started writing screenplays before I started writing books. I wrote screenplays and teleplays for about 15 years, and now I've been writing books for the past 11 years. So I feel like my roots are in screenplays. And the thing about scripts is that you have a much more finite amount of time to tell your story. I mean, you have to tell it in two hours, which is roughly 120 pages, and they're very spaced out pages. They're not, <laughs> they're not like book pages, a lot less words. I'd say an average script of two hours is around 20,000 words, if that gives you a better idea of how long a screenplay is. So one of the things they kind of drill in your head in screenwriting courses and film school is that you need a hook, but you need that hook to be a part of the setup. And what I mean by that is like, think of Princess Bride, where it doesn't start off with like this crazy action piece hook kind of thing. It starts out with a sick kid and his grandpa comes to read him a book. And then once they dive into the story, that's when we get to meet Wesley and Buttercup and, and it kind of begins from there. So there is no like, BAM! It's interesting because when people say hook, you automatically think, oh, I've got to, in my first three pages, I have to, I have to hook them by some crazy moment like you jumping in the middle of an action scene or something like that. And that's that's kind of, if you think about it, if you go back through a lot of even action movies or books, they don't really start out that way. Think about something like Die Hard. There's no real action until page 13. I wouldn't even constitute it as action. It's when the truck starts driving towards the building. So we all know it's the terrorists. It's sort of a looming, dooming music truck driving. But it isn't until page 17 that the terrorists actually enter the building, kill the guard, and replace the guard. So now we're in. Why would anyone read to page 17? if you think about it. If they didn't know anything about the screenplay, they just had the title, which kind of makes you think it's an action film, but they didn't know anything about it. They just cold read. What would make them turn the page to even get to page 17 where the terrorists take over the building? All we really know in that 17 pages is that John McClane and Holly McClane are separated. He's coming to visit for Christmas and there's just a lot of tension between the two of them because you know they're on the verge of divorce but you can see that there's still love between them but they're both very stubborn people. I mean if you're reading that and you don't know there's terrorists coming I, I don't know what you would think you were reading. So what are the clues like what did the writer set up to make us know that this isn't just going to be a movie about a couple that split up that gets back together or doesn't or whatever. So right off the bat, we start off in an airplane where John McClane obviously doesn't like to fly and the guy next to him says, fists with your toes, we all remember this, barefoot and fist with, with your toes, which now we know is horrible advice for later on in the movie. But 
when he's getting up to get his luggage and his giant teddy bear for his kid, the guy sees the gun and then he says, don't worry, I'm a cop. I've been doing it for 11 years. So now we know in the first two pages, really the first page, that John McClane is a cop, carries a gun with him on the plane. I don't even know if they can do that anymore. And it sets a mood. You know something's up. You know we can, you're already kind of feeling like something is going to happen that they focus on this gun and that we know that John McClane can kind of take care of himself. Then the rest is just set up because we have to care about these characters in order to root for them to beat the terrorists. Because let's face it, Alan Rickman uh, was a genius and there's a tiny part of everyone that kind of roots for him because he's so funny, so amazing. So that is the purpose of those first 17 pages. If you actually go through movies that you like, you'll find out that around page 17, the commitment to the journey is where you're going to find the real, I guess, hook that I think people normally associate with the word hook. Like Back to the Future. Page 17 is when Marty arrives at the abandoned parking lot at the mall and Doc tells him that he's invented a time machine. And then of course we know that the terrorists there show up. 17 is where it's boom. Okay, here we go. Time machine. Now we're in. Now we know what's happening. And in Field of Dreams, page 17 is when he's talking with his wife about how they're not going to make any money because he built this baseball field in the middle of their farm. And they're finally coming to terms with the fact they're probably going to have to take the baseball field down in order for them to even break even in their bills. And the daughter walks up to the table and says, Daddy, there's a man on our lawn. I feel like goosebumps. And now I want to watch that movie. That's the moment where it's like, no, you're not getting rid of the field. And now the story is going to explode from there. And if anyone's interested, since I was talking about Princess Bride before, page 17 is when, when Inigo is left behind to fight Wesley and Buttercup and Vicini take off. That's the moment where Wesley now connects with Inigo. Where is that moment in books? That's the thing is it's there. It's, it's just you get a little bit more time to breathe. Think about Hunger Games. The book doesn't start out with the reaping. It starts out with Katniss. You see her hunting outside where she's not supposed to be. And that's when you kind of learn the rules about the districts and you hear about the reaping. The very end of the chapter is the reaping. And the last line in the chapter is that her sister was chosen. And that happens around page 20. And then of course the next chapter is Katniss volunteering for her sister and every like chaos ensues. You get at least a chapter to really get to know the person, to get to know the character, to really get an idea of what her life is like, who she is, and how much she loves her sister. And then ooh, she's volunteering for her sister. And if I were to guess, I didn't check the movie, I would guess that that moment that she volunteers is probably around page 17. So when I switched to books, I felt like I could breathe a little more. I could really explore the characters and get to know them because in screenwriting, you can't get inside their heads unless you narrate. And it's, it's very rare that narration works for really a first time writer or specs. I mean, we can't all be Frank Darabont and write Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> which is brilliant, by the way, and perfect use of narration. So usually you are, you are getting to know the character through action and through dialogue. It's a little bit more difficult because you, in a book, you can dive deep inside their head. And I feel like you can make a connection with the reader as well as with yourself when you're writing books because you can just, at least in the beginning, you know, I know you have to edit later, but in the beginning you can kind of just flow. Like, well, what are they thinking? What's going on in their heads? And get to know them on a deeper level level. But what I do like to do in books and what I do like in books is when the first line or paragraph is kind of a hook or at least it gives you a glimpse into what the book is going to be about. With Riser, my first book, in the first sentence I pretty much say she's a necromancer. So that'll definitely paint you a picture of what the book is going to be about. She has powers, she can raise the dead. And then I go into her backstory, how she got her powers. 
I don't even get into the world until the next chapter. So I really wanted to focus on her, who she is. Hopefully the reader can connect to her in that first chapter. And what I like to do at the end of my first chapters is kind of the same thing what we were talking about like in Hunger Games and, and like page 17 and scripts where you're committing to the journey. You know what this book's gonna be about by the end of chapter one. In Alexis Tappendorf, my middle grade book, she's miserable that she has to move to Virginia and so she's sort of pouting in the back seat of the car as they're driving to her great aunt's house and she sees all these men with metal detectors. Every couple hundred feet, there's another guy with the metal detector. The end of the chapter I must find out why these men have metal detectors and are on the road. Surprise they're looking for treasure. <laughs> so that sort of sets the mood if you will for the book. <laughs> As you can tell I am a format junkie. Obviously there are books and scripts that are able to go off structure that are genius and wonderful but I can't write like that. That's just not me. And one of the sayings that's always really resonated with me is structure sets you free. That absolutely may not be the case for a lot of people, but for me, it's absolutely true. Because once I have the structure, once I have the outline, once I know where every plot point is, it really does set me free. And it's weird because I know it sounds contradictory, but it really isn't because then I know where I need to go and it helps me to write to those things and it gives me that freedom of how to get there. So I can't wait to watch everybody's videos and their take on the dreaded opener. Although I have to say, writing the opening to scripts or books or anything is actually my favorite part of the process. I'm one of those people that has more dread for the middle. <laughs> Maybe the next subject for the collabs will be tackling act two. <laughs> Well, let me know in the comments what you guys think of story openers. Do you find them difficult? Are you like me and you have a dozen files of just the opening? <laughs> of books and screenplays, but never touched them again. I, I, I have so many. I'll just write the beginning and then loop, never touch it again. Let me know and thank you guys so much for watching and be sure to check out everybody else's videos as well. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.